G'day, in this video we'll be going over Dr. Christine Jones's um, presentations on quorum sensing. Now, if you don't know who I am, I'm Teal Simmons. I run Agrisol, a regenerative agriculture consulting business in Australia. Um, I absolutely love soil and soil microbes. And so this video will be deep diving into how microbes can talk to each other um, and how that's important for your farm. Now, I mentioned Dr. Christine Jones because I first learnt this from her uh, with her retirement. Um, I thought it would be a good opportunity to present uh, this in um, uh, another medium as well as to uh, just get that information out there and to add some of my own understanding to the subject. So, to start off, um, typically pest, is, pest and disease, low nutrients and low productivity is a function of low diversity of microbes in our soil. So if you're struggling with any of these, and I talk to a lot of farmers and we all are, um, we can always go after more production, you know, higher amounts of nutrition in our soil and lower pest and disease pressure, that'd be the dream. Ultimately, that is a function of uh, low diversity in our microbes because microbes contribute so much to plant health um, and resistance against pest and disease. But the question is, why is low diversity in our microbes important and why, how does that affect these things? And so one of those explanations is found in quorum sensing and we'll get into that now. So quorum sensing is simply density dependent coordinated behavior in um, microbes that typically uh, regulate gene expression. And so that uh, results um, in gene expression within either the microbial population or uh, and or uh, the host plant or animal. And this is really interesting because uh, especially when we have uh, soils that are not dense of soil microbes, which means we're missing out on a lot of gene uh, expression. Now, if you don't have a very good understanding of gene expression and uh, genomics and whatnot, a really quick explanation is that we have genes, a whole range of different genes um, in our, say, DNA. Or DNA, we have DNA, and of that DNA, there's genes. Some of those genes uh, code for proteins. Some of those genes regulate other genes. And then there's a whole range of different junk genes or junk DNA that we don't really know what it does or we think it does nothing. Some of those genes are not always, uh, always expressing. So some genes are always expressing, uh, some genes aren't. The genes that aren't always expressing uh, can be turned on and off. That's called epigenetics. Now this, plays into epigenetics where the environment determines the expression of genes. And so one of those environments is the communication of microbes. They're not like us, they can't hear or see. So what they do to communicate with each other is the production of auto-inducers. Now auto-inducers are simply uh, signaling compounds that they uh, make and release into the soil for either uh, the same species to pick up or different species to pick up. Uh, when it's the same species, it's species specific. So they can, they can communicate in their own language, but a lot of microbes can also communicate in a range of different languages, they're bilingual, which means the auto inducers released by a certain bacteria species can then be picked up by another bacteria species or a fungal species or plants and animals. Simply in that, our microbes can communicate with each other, but that's not quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is when you have a specific density of that. And so you can see here in these two boxes, we have say a low density of a specific bacteria and they're producing low amounts of uh, auto inducers versus a high amount of uh, bac uh, bacteria. They're producing a high amount of uh, auto inducers. Now quorum sensing requires a threshold, so a certain density or concentration of those auto inducers to be produced and say we need a hundred um, parts of those auto inducers within a certain bit, uh, we need to reach that or exceed it in order for gene expression to occur. If we only have three, it's not going to occur, even if that's present. So what happens is once that uh, threshold is reached, the genes within the bacteria or the plant or the animal or whatever is switched to uh, non-expressive to expressive. We can talk about what's, what will happen next, but effectively all these bacteria suddenly are going to be expressing that gene uh, when the threshold is reached. If it's not, nothing's going to happen. Now this is really important for soil microbes because it allows for the conservation of a lot of resources and energy um, by them. 
if they were continu continuously expressing this gene, then they'll be using up all this energy uh, for potentially no impact. There might only be an impact if you have a certain a number of microbes expressing that particular gene and, uh, and producing a certain amount of, say, enzymes or, or compounds. So these guys know that if they're, if they're not going to do it properly, there's no point in doing it at all. So a really good example of that is, say, E. coli uh, in our own health. There's, there's likely to be a very small uh, population of E. coli in our own guts at any particular time. But we're not, we don't have a disease quite yet. What causes the disease is a buildup of E. coli, um, and once it reaches that particular threshold, they release the toxins, and then we get sick. There's no point in the E. coli, in the one or two um, single organisms pro uh, producing those toxins because it's going to use up their resources and they know we're not going to get sick. So they wait until they get a buildup. So this is used in both pathogens as well as beneficial microbes. And I saw a whole range of different um, uh, beneficial or negative microbes. So some examples of this is uh, rhizomium bacteria. So they're, they're the ones that live in the nodules of uh, legumes. Now, uh, quorum sensing is required for these guys in terms of nodulation. So they have to reach a certain threshold. They're, so they're releasing all these auto inducers all the time. Uh, they reach a threshold to then release what's called a node uh, factor, which then indicates to the plant, hey, we're ready for nodulation, there's enough of us uh, for you to then nodulate. Uh, this is important so no one wastes time and effort in the nodulation process if there wasn't enough uh, rhizomium bacteria to be nodulated or to, to uh, nodulate. Another example is uh, pseudomonas. They require they use uh, quorum sensing in the production of uh, antibiotics. A thing called uh, cytomone, cytomorphs, uh, which is used in the chelation of iron, as well as biofilm, which helps to protect uh, the bacteria um, during stressful times. Likewise, they require a certain threshold in order to uh, to be uh, activated. Antibiotics can be used um, to defend against different soil-borne pathogens uh, for plants. Um, so things like fusarium, this can be used to defend against it. Likewise, there's no point in these guys producing antibiotics if there's no um, uh, pathogens because it's just simply wasting their resources. They wait until there's uh, communication between the pathogen and uh, pseudomonas before it actually begins in a plant. I'm sure there's a whole very complicated uh, process happening there. Another uh, great example is Bacillus, uh, and actually Pseudomonas uh, does this as well, but it's in the production of uh, phosphatase. Now phosphatase is an enzyme used to solubilize phosphorus, or locked up phosphorus in the soil. And so uh, there needs to be enough uh, Bacillus or Pseudomonas in the soil releasing these auto inducers for it to start producing Phosphatase, so that it has an impact in actually producing uh, phosphorus, soluble phosphorus for our plants. And so all of these things, plus so many more in our soil, um, are important agriculturally. And so if you think of uh, solubilizing phosphorus, how many people are applying uh, super, that basically gets all locked up within a few weeks. Making sure we have high amounts of bacillus, a uh, high um, population of bacillus in our soil will help us utilize more of our phosphorus. So the question now is, in terms of agricultural production, how can we stimulate these microbes to, to uh, reap these benefits? And there's two different ways. So the first one is the application of biostimulants. Biostimulants can include, uh, where, where is it, auto inducers. So if, uh, things like uh, liquid vermiculture extracts, they contain a whole range of different auto inducers to then stimulate different uh, enzymes, uh, different microbes to do different things. This is also why you only need a very, very small amount to actually get a uh, impact because you only need you know, parts per billions, uh, potentially parts per trillions of these auto inducers to actually get a effect. So making recommendations on uh, biosimilars is something we do as part of our consulting. Uh, if this interests you, you can uh, work with us. We have a 30-minute uh, free consultation for anyone interested in using this, you head to our website. Um, but anyways, the second way you can stimulate this is by increasing the diversity of our plants. 
And so what you find when you have a high amount of diversity in say your cover crop or even your cash crop when you have uh, intercropping or companion plants is that the range of plant root extradites and the unique rhizosphere around the plants can increase the population of different microbes and simulate them to increase, uh, to, to enhance, to activate quorum sensing. Now on the other side of this uh, is what's called quorum uh, quenching, which is where say you do have a pathogen in a soil, um, putting a quorum sensing, so that pathogen is quorum sensing to then hurt the plant. Uh, there can be a, a disruption in that communication when you have high amounts of biodiversity. So if everyone's releasing all these um, auto inducers, then sometimes the signal between uh, the pathogens can get disrupted and so we're going to reduce uh, disease. So I hope that makes uh, a bit of sense. Remember, um, we can use biostimulants to activate it as well as uh, inoculants and increasing biodiversity in, our, uh, in the plants we grow. Again, if this is something you want to do on your farm, uh, implement these biological applications uh, recommendations, come and talk to us. We have a free 30 minute consultation um, and we can lead you on the right path of uh, in implementing this without losing yields and profits. Again, thanks very much for watching. My name is Steele Simmons. Cheers.